So, maybe it's, we should start with the introduction, Steve, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So, thanks everyone for coming uh, today. Uh, this talk was supposed to be in person, but unfortunately, due to COVID, how many times does that need to be said this year and probably the next? Uh, he couldn't make it in person, uh, but he's happy to give us this talk online, uh, which we are very grateful for because it's really, really interesting, this talk and, and his work in general. Uh, so Steve, just to give a small introduction, I met Steve Hawkinson uh, in 2007, where I did my master's in Plymouth at the University of Plymouth. And he was so generous. He gave me a job at the Marine Biological Association, where I was counting barnacles. And I wouldn't be surprised if barnacles come up in the talk. Uh, so maybe that will give an insight. But I was very grateful for this job. And it really helped me a lot in my career, actually, in the end. So the reason why he's here is actually because he's also a very good collaborator, a good friend and collaborator of Karl Gunnarsson at the Institute. And through Karl, uh, we planned this talk with Steve. So Steve is actually a professor or emeritus professor at the uh, University of Southampton. And uh, he is, uh, has also been, has, has many jobs in his, in his life and many, uh, that is in Icelandic, so I'm actually translating as I go, sorry. And has, has basically also been the head of the uh, Marine Biological Association in, in Plymouth, which is a very old and established uh, Marine Research Institute. Uh, he's also uh, editor of many international uh, scientific journals, including uh, Oceanography and Marine Biological Annual Review. And he has done quite an extensive, uh, quite ex has a quite extensive list of publications as well. So uh, yes, he is basically a really good scientist. I'm really happy to have him introduce his work. So I just want to give it over to you now, Steve, if that's okay. Okay, well, it's, 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 it's nice to be in Iceland, even if it's virtually from my wife's um, living room in Switzerland. Um, this is the first talk I've ever given wearing tracksuit bottoms and bare feet, but it's a very warm flat. Um, I'm sorry I'm not here, I'm, I'm not there with you today. It's I just basically... Uh, chickened out and decided it wasn't worth the risk. But I'm going to crack on with my talk now. I'm going to talk about rocky shores and how they can be used as uh, sentinel systems for understanding climate change. Um, ah. Okay. Um, I've been to Iceland lots of times since... Um, uh, since 1985, when uh, Agnar first invited me to, to uh, give a, a help teach a course on the uh, Nordic Ecology course on uh, rocky shores. And um, these were some of the excellent Liverpool facilitators that uh, helped keep things on track uh, during my uh, retirement conference in 2015. I, I'm now uh, retired, but still fairly active but mainly doing things I like doing, like rocky shore field work. And a lot of people have been involved in this work. And if there's, if there's a king of the elves, it's Alan Southwood. He got me interested in this work over 40 years ago and was very much involved in, in this work, which actually involved uh, rescuing and analyzing a lot of his data um, right up to his untimely uh, death in 2007. So I'm going to talk a bit about the MBA and its uh, long-term studies that go back over 100 years, particularly in relation to climate change. I'm going to try to persuade you why the British Isles and Ireland are so sensitive to climate change in terms of shifts in marine biodiversity. I'm going to do this by giving examples of fluctuations and recent rapid change in the English Channel and around the British Isles and Ireland. I'm going to try to convince you that rocky shores are really good sentinel systems to, de to detect climate change. And, uh, and this is partly due to the fact there's lots of understanding because of a lot of experimental ecologies being done on rocky shores. 
And I'm also going to mention in passing, in addition to um, the fact it's getting warmer, sea level rise towards the end, and hopefully a few useful take home messages. So the MBA has been around for a long time. And during that period, it's had lots and lots of long term data sets, many of which unfortunately stopped in the 1980s. And during my time as director, I started to restarted a lot of them. And again, some of them are at risk again. But the one thing that we have been able to keep going are the observations on intertidal organisms, partly because it's cheap, partly because they're accessible, and, uh, and partly because you don't need huge amounts of logistics and ships. So we managed to keep those going. Uh, and these go back at least 70 years, and some of them back to the 1930s. Now, this is an old IPCC graph, but I like to show it because for the Northern Hemisphere, it shows after a fairly rapid period of warming, there was a cold dip, and then in recent years, it's got warm again. And it's really important if we're looking at global change now, to put it in context of the last warm peak, not the last cold trough, because it tends to exaggerate things. And we're fortunate that we've got rocky shore observations from the 1950s, which is the last warm period in the British Isles before things started to get much, much warmer in the late 1980s after the rather cool period of the 60s, 70s and the 1980s. Uh, think, think flare trousers, think synthesizer music in the 1980s. So everyone agrees that climate change is happening. This is from the 2014 IPCC. It hasn't changed much. There's a few dissenting voices, but fortunately they're gone now and the USS, USA has signed up again. Um, I was at the 2015 um, Paris summit in one of the fringe meetings, actually talking about rocky shore ecology and climate change. And there was a huge mood of optimism there about trying to keep things down under two degrees. Let's keep our fingers crossed for Glasgow 2021. I think it's getting even more urgent now, six years on. And I think it's really important that we do try to keep things somewhere in this region rather than this region, which is what might happen with unconstrained um, carbon emissions. So this is my patch of the ocean off Plymouth, lots of fluctuations. Um, this is data collected by the British Navy, then the MBA, PML and MBA subsequently. A warm period just after the lab was founded, a very cold period either side of the First World War, a warm period up to the late 1950s, and then a very, very cold winter in 62, 63. The first time I saw snow as a, as a six-year-old on the south coast of England. And then a cool period in the 60s and 70s. And then from the late 1980s onwards, a period of recent rapid warming. And then a bit of a cold downturn, 2009, 2010, particularly 2010, 2011, were really, really cold winters. Uh, but then the curve is beginning to kick back up again. So back in the 1850s, um, a, a chap called Edward Forbes, who actually came from the Isle of Man, but was a professor at Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh there, um, published this map showing that the, the British Isles and Ireland to the south and west had warm water species, southern types as he called them, and to the north and east, were, were cold water types, northern types. Now, this is a pretty good map. And um, this is a much more high tech version of this, which was published by Mike Burroughs and other people, um, myself in uh, Global Change Biology last year. And this is based on the thermal affinities of the 60 to 70 uh, regularly surveyed species that we, do, that we look at. And it's a community temperature index. And it shows quite nicely to, that um, the southwest of Britain and the west coast of Ireland and even pockets in the, uh, in the Hebrides have quite a lot of warm affinity species in their assemblages. And as you go further to the north, it gets more uh, cold assemblage. And that's for the animals. This is for the seaweeds. Uh, the seaweeds are probably a bit more um, cold in their affinities. And perhaps this ref represents differential transarctic exchange of species about 3.8 million years ago, when a lot of the North Atlantic was colonized by species coming in from the North Pacific, particularly lots of the big brown algae, such as kelps and the fucroids. Um, and as a consequence, you get quite a, a, a good response with the animals, you get a somewhat slower response uh, with the plants. And that's 
probably because the animals have more diverse thermal affinities than the macroalgae, and also because many of the macroalgae around the British Isles um, tend to have their range centres uh, to the north. So I'm going to talk about shifts in range and changes in abundance for rocky shores, which is an update of work previously published and in various reviews and recycling publications since. So this is me seven days before lockdown, no social distancing on the seashore here um, with, um, with Mauricio, one of my ex-PhD students who's been involved in this work. And this is a site I first visited with Alan and Eve Southwood in 1980, uh, seven days before lockdown. And when I started working on this, and when I came to Iceland in 1985 to talk about rocky shores, I actually talked about it getting colder because I was interested in not only with barnacles, which is Alan's, Alan Southwood's work, but I was interested in limpets about why these warm water um, limpets were much, much scarcer in the early 1980s at the end of the cold period than they had been during the warm 1950s. So I can't be accused of getting on the climate change bandwagon. I was actually interested in it getting colder when I started um, this work. And this builds, our work at the MBA that started in about 2002, um, built on work done by Crispin Southwood and Fisher Piet, and also time series by Alan Southwood and my own Olympic time series started in 1980. And also work by Jack Lewis and team who did some work up, uh, up from the University of Leeds until sadly that laboratory was shut down during the Thatcherite 1980s. So our aims were to basically collate and archive old data um, to continue and restart time series. Our arm was uh, counting barnacles as part of that work, try to show that changes had occurred in the, in, in the intertidal species in response to climate change, come up with some testable hypotheses, do some experiments to try to understand some of the mechanisms involved in change. And the bit led by Mike Burroughs, who's a very clever modeler, was to try to make some future changes based on climate uh, scenarios, using modeling based on this long-term data. And we had lots of long-term data from the 1950s, collected by Crisp and Southwood, including sites all around Ireland. These are just the sites in the UK. And this gave us a very broad scale baseline against which to judge change. Um, and again, getting back to our, um, our graph of uh, temperatures off Plymouth, um, we started this work in about two, late 1990s, 2000, and actually warming had been underway for some time. And sadly, there's a bit of a gap in the data. Alan Southwood was made to take early retirement in 1987 due to some institutional restructuring. And then there was a bit of a gap in the data. And I continued this work when I moved from the Isle of Man down to Southampton. In contrast, the cold water species still seem to be persisting, but not very well high on the shore. Um, but levels were probably a bit less than they had been during peak coolness in the, in, in the late 1960s. This is the one site that we managed to keep going all the time because Alan and I had a PhD student that worked um, on the Isle of Man in the late 1990s, but was based at Plymouth some of the time. And this site is actually uh, about half a kilometer from my house as the seagull flies, and at low tide about a kilometer walk. When the tide's in, it's about three kilometers. Um, and uh, this is a very convenient long-term site. And you can see in the 1950s, the warm water species in red of Cathalamus, these are barnacles, did well. They then declined during the uh, 60s, 70s, and uh, up to the early 80s, the cold water species, Semibalanus balanoides did well, and then started to decline. And also an invasive species was shown coming in. This is now called Ostrominius. This is a barnacle from Australia that came in probably on convoys during the uh, Second World War. And NOVA followed up work done by Jack Lewis's team in the north of Scotland. This is a warm water chop shell, Gibbon and Bilicalis. Um, she, she showed range extensions along the north coast of, uh, of Scotland. And these days there's a small population on Orkney, which is there, which we've discovered in, in recent years. But it's a long way from getting to Shetland and the Faroes in Iceland. And we did a lot of work in the English Channel. And in the 1950s and the 1980s, most species used to stop either on the Isle of Wight. Um, this was particularly convenient when I was working in Southampton or in the case of um, this species, uh, Portland Bill. And uh, 
these are major hydrographic barriers with a lot of offshore dispersion going on, uh, we think. Uh, but when we resume, resume surveys in the early, uh, early 2000s, um, 2004, we did the first bit of work. To my great surprise, I honestly thought this was going to be a really hard boundary. We found several species had extended, their ranges had extended to the, um, to the east of the Isle of Wight into the colder English Channel. But it differed for different species. Patella depressa, a warm water species, my favourite limpet, never made it to Ireland after the last ice age. And it made a rather pathetic little jump from the Isle of Wight just over here to Portsmouth. Um, other species spread much better. The best spreader of the lot seemed to be Giblin bilicalis, and this has a larval life of maybe one or two days and seems able to make little steps and consolidate those population increases. Um, whereas barnacles with longer lived larvae don't seem to be able to make such big, big, big leaps because even though they could get there, there's a need for gregarious settlement. So barnacles end up settling next to each other. And I think this reinforces alley effects and means that uh, um, counterintuitively, those with the longest larvae find it more difficult to probably establish populations and make range extensions than, the, than those with short-lived larvae that can make little steps. And a student with Roger Herbert at the University of Bournemouth did some modelling. This is larval release um, to the uh, west of the Isle of Wight, and she showed quite convincingly with uh, hydrodynamic modelling that any larvae released here would basically get swept out to sea, which probably explains why this was such a high barrier. These days, however, things have changed. Um, many of these species are, have got extended breeding seasons. They're, they're reproducing for most of the summer. So they're putting lots and lots of larvae out into the plankton. So the probability of a larvae successfully getting past this hydrographic barrier is much, much greater than before. And in addition, there's been massive broad scale modification of the coastline. There's vast numbers of, um, of artificial habitats all the way along the coast. And these are potential stepping stones for species to get over gaps in habitats such as sandy or shingly beaches. And, uh, and therefore the ranges of these species are extending accordingly. More propagules getting past barriers, and if they do get there, perhaps artificial habitat, allowing them to establish themselves further east than they would do normally. So this is where we are now. There's further range extensions have been found uh, for these various species, um, even though it did get a bit colder from probably 2005 onwards and was particularly cold either side of, uh, of 2010. So if we look at all the way around the British Isles, we've got various warm water southern species that have shown range extensions to different extents. Um, but conversely, we've not seen so much in terms of retreats of cold water species around the British Isles, though their abundance has got a lot less. This species actually reaches its southern limit in the Irish Sea and on the East Coast. It was very common when I was doing my PhD on the Isle of Man in the 90s. So let's return to my favourite animals, limpets, and um, see how they're doing. Um, on the south, in the south of Britain. Patella depressa is now 60 to 80% of the population on the, on the north coast of, um, of, of Britain, in, including at uh, Ron's favourite spot, Port West to Cornwall. Occasionally, I even get 100% Patella depressa in the odd quadrat. Um, similarly, on the south coast of Britain, in many spots, they're now greater than 50%. And there's now breeding populations established south of the Thleen Peninsula in, in Cardigan Bay. So this species has is doing better in terms of abundance within its range. 
at sites where we've got some long-term data. This was near my mother's house in North Devon, and I used to visit this regularly. You can see there's been an increase in the proportion of the warm water species in the total population. Quite a bit of noise in the data, a lot of gaps in the data, but generally an increase in the proportions at these three sites in the southwest. Um, Mauricio Aristica, who I've co-supervised with Stuart Jenkins at Bangor, has been going through my dusty old notebooks, extracting data, and has done a much more detailed analysis of, the, of these changes at various sites, at range edge sites and non-range edge sites in the British Isles. And um, quite a lot of noise in the data, but you can see that in, in all places, compared to when I started in 1980, Patella depressa is a, the southern species is a much greater proportion of the population. Though there are some signs of recent downturn um, in both non-range edge and range edge populations um, just after 2010, which was a really cold winter, and perhaps some signs of kicking back up again afterwards. This part is actually a non-geographic boundary population. There's actually a, an estuarine gradient up into the mega estuary of the Bristol Channel. And um, these populations are, have got a lot um, more common in recent years, probably due to um, increased recruitment from ones just down the coast in, in fully marine conditions. So this isn't a geographic boundary, it's a, it's a, a local environmental boundary but of a very, very big estuary indeed. And there's greater penetration up the Bristol Channel occurring now than previously as this species is doing better. So changes within range probably drive range edge processes due to greater propagule pressure. But what has become clear is very different things are happening in Wales than are happening here in the south of England. And Mauricio did quite a lot of detailed analysis of this. And this is from a a manuscript we're trying to get published, uh, submitted hopefully by Christmas, um, showing that in North Wales, he was actually studying in Bangor, so this was convenient for the population in the 80s, there were still some residual populations there. I probably removed Of, um, of, of the Thleen Peninsula, even though populations were increasing south of the Thleen Peninsula, uh, odd individuals only. So this seems to be a very, very hard hydrographic barrier. In contrast, the Isle of Wight, perhaps helped by all this artificial habitat, which used to... Okay, thank you. Um, so now um, we can see this is some updated data for the north of Britain that Mike Burroughs put together. Um, you can see this dip and maybe a slight upturn. So though things have got warmer, there has been the slightly cooler bit and maybe post 2010 populations are recovering. And I think what's happened is once these hydrographic barriers have been breached, like on the south coast of England, populations can establish themselves and they can keep reproducing. And there's almost some inertia once these very proximate hydrographic barriers have been penetrated. Mike also analyzed data for the 60 plus common intertidal species we had over time uh, for Southwest Britain, and also using a, um, a monitoring set from Shetland set up around the oil terminal there. And he did pick up the effects of the cooling that we've seen um, post about 2005 with the um, this mean climate um, affinity index for both plants and animals, more so in the southwest of Britain actually than in um, Shetland. But in Shetland you can see the animals increasing and then maybe declining a little bit in recent years since probably peak levels in mid-2005. So I just want to reiterate that what goes on at range edges um, is very much driven 
by what goes on with, within range populations, because that's where the, the larvae, the, the recruits are coming from. You can see this decline and you can see this slight kick up occurring there. And this has continued. This year, I even managed to find a patella depressor here, the furthest east in the channel. And we found a lot, lot more of this species of top shell, this trochid os uh, ocellinus, now called Forcus. Um, in this, period, this part of the English Channel, clearly these populations are consolidating and self-recruiting. Again, this is a species with quite short larval um, length of life. Now, the best data we had was Alan Southwood's data for barnacles, and Mike Burroughs used this to, to do some predictive modelling of what might happen with interacting species uh, in relation to climate change, particularly interacting north and south species of barnacles. Uh, and this involved both statistical analysis of past data sets, but also some process-based modeling, including direct and indirect effects of uh, climate variables, and then using these to make forecasts using climate change scenarios. So these are the barnacles, which uh, Hron was counting, that's semi-balanced balanoides, the, the barnacle that occurs in Iceland. And these are two southern barnacles, which Alan Southwood split into two species in about 1976. But we aggregate the data um, for these, for this genera, um, which at this particular site are dominating the shore. So this is Alan's data. This is my data, which was continued subsequently. Um, but Mike confined his analysis to Alan's data. And we do know because of the work of this chap, this is Joe Connell, who did the classic paper on competition that's in every ecology textbook between um, Balanus balanoides, as it was called then, and Cathalamus montagui. And actually at Millport, they're all Cathalamus montagui. And uh, Joe Connell showed that semi Balanus outcompeted Cathalamids and restricted it to high shore. This was faster growing the dominant competitor. Mike analysed the data and found that the best correlation was, um, the previous, was with the previous uh, spring, with a negative correlation for semi balanced with warm years and a positive correlation for cathalamids with, um, with warm years the previous year. We use sea surface temperature as a general proxy, though many of these effects will actually occur um, when the tide is out. But a warm SST in, in June means it's a warm year and a hotter, dry year anyway. But when Mike did some uh, causal path analysis, whilst he demonstrated that both high on the shore and the middle of the shore, there was a very strong direct relationship of sea surface temperature to the northern barnacle, there wasn't a significant effect on the southern barnacle. But in fact, what was driving the southern barnacle was a negative relationship with semi balanced balanoides. So this is very strong indication of an indirect competition mediated effect. So what's in fact happening is in warm years, um, cathalamids are released from, from the dominant northern species, semi balanced balanoides. And that's because they, they grow very slowly and they don't settle in anything like the huge numbers that semi balanced can do in a good recruitment year. So Mike and Elvira, Poliskanska, who um, actually was the, the lead author on this work, um, did some modelling with just physics and then with some physics modified by biology with a, a space limited competition term uh, put into the model. And physics alone is pretty, pretty good for semi balanced balanoides, but awful for cathalamids, but it is much more plausible um, for um, the cathalamids if there's some biology put into the model because of these indirect effects. This model was then used to make predictions going into the future um, under different emission scenarios. This was done back in uh, back 2004 and um, at the end of the day this basically showed that the dominant barnacle in the English Channel in the 1930s and the 1960s, semi balanced balanoides, would more or less disappear in, um, in basically about 50 years from now. And under both emission scenarios, the shores in the English Channel would basically resemble those in, in Portugal, dominated by the slow growing warm water species. 
and semi-valorness only occurring in odd isolated refuge populations. So I think my main messages here is that climate change responses are not a monotonic line, that species responses are idiosyncratic, dependent on life histories, dispersal habitat requirements, and very much influenced by proximate factors such as coastal hydrography. There's good evidence they can be modified by bilateral interactions. So I think ultimately temperature is the ultimate factor driving patterns, but proximate effects um, can override this ultimate um, driver and actually set the actual limits of species and limit spread. But once they're breached, they seem to continue spreading even with a little recent cooling down. So does it matter? Does it matter that this species of limpet is replaced by this species of limpet? There's only probably five or six people in the UK that can do this, sadly, including my wife who's actually worked in the pharmaceutical industry, but gets dragged out on the shore a lot to help. Um, does it really matter? You know, Olympic's Olympic, Olympic is Olympic, but perhaps not. Back when I was doing my PhD, I proposed this simple model for patch dynamics on rocky shores um, for the Isle of Man and probably uh, the northern half of Britain. And that showed that um, escapes of seaweeds, fucus are much more likely amongst dense barnacles, once escape occurs, you get aggregations of limpets underneath the fucus clumps. They shelter underneath them. They also feed on the fucus, as we found out subsequently. Because the limpets are bunched in one place, and because they disaggregate more slowly than they aggregate, you get areas where there's less grazing pressure. And as a consequence, uh, you get new escapes of fucus, particularly if there's been dense settlement barnacles. And, and Mike Burroughs helped me uh, help with some modeling of this, which we published in 1998. But Patella depressa doesn't aggregate under seaweed clumps, unlike Patella vulgata. And, and uh, Pip Moore did some very nice work where she experimentally manipulated fucus clumps. If she removed fucus under which limpets were sheltering, 33% of Patella vulgata died. The rest either moved to another clump or ended up clumping up with other limpets. Um, whereas patella depressa were pretty impervious to the presence of absence of fucus clumps. If anything, they tended to avoid them. And some of Mauricio's work, which we're hoping to publish again by Christmas, suggests that under fucus canopies, maybe patella vulgata beats up um, patella depressa, the cold water species, is a outcompetes patella depressa, particularly under damp, cold fucoids. So if we return to this cycle, which was, which was derived from Patella vulgata on the Isle of Man, where there are, um, well, until the one I found, no Patella depressor, um, what does this mean? Well, firstly, Cathalamus is a much smaller barnacle than Semibalanus balanoides, so that there's less nooks and crannies for fucoid germlings to escape limpet grazing. There's also going to be um, so there's less chance of algal escapes with smaller cathalamids. The water a species, not just limpets, but top shells are getting more important in abundance. So there's more grazer species reducing the chances of escape. There's many more patella depressor and they don't aggregate. So there's a more even grazing field, which means that the probability of these escapes occurring is probably going to be less. Um, before I completely retire, I want to have one more go at modeling this with some clever younger people um, with different behavioral traits for limpets in the model. So maybe this dynamic patchiness might cease further south in Britain and I think we've got some evidence to suggest that. So there's going to be lower frequency of fucus escapes, there's probably going to be a shift across the balance of barnacle dominated shores versus seaweed dominated shores. Um, and maybe a less dynamic system because of, 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 of subtle but key differences in the behaviour of important limpet grazers on these shores. And just to reinforce this, semi balanus grows faster and there's going to be much more secondary productivity compared to cathalamids. So that's a semi balanus dominated shore. That's one with a mixture. That's probably a five month year old semi-balanus, that's probably a five-year-old cathalamus. 
and this is the same size. These pictures are the same size, um, same scale. So if we get a system dominated by these barnacles, they're, they're much smaller, they're slower growing, they don't form dense humps, there's less chance of uh, fucus escapes. So this is a shore on the Isle of Man that I've been photographing on and on, off and on since back 1977. Sometimes it's fucoid dominated, it's moderately exposed and the balance between seaweeds and limpets is sort of on the knife edge on this shore. Sometimes it's patchy, sometimes it's limpet barnacle dominated. Um, and I think that sh shores of this nature are gonna spend much more time in this phase. They might even get permanently shifted to this phase. And these seaweed dominated shores are net producers. They produce a lot of detritus. These are net importers. So this is gonna have a big effect on production of the whole system. So the balance between grazers and suspension feeders um, and the few coins will change. There's going to be less probability of escapes. And a, and a student, Joao Ferreira, um, did some really nice work in North Wales and in Portugal. Um, Stuart Jenkins was the lead supervisor. I co-supervised this work and actually showed that in Portugal, it was a combination of stress on early growth of few coins and grazing pressure, which stopped few coin recruitment compared with a much greater recruitment in North Wales. If there's less fucoids, there's going to be less shelter, lower diversity, because lots of things live in fucoids and amongst fucoids and underneath fucoids, a lot less primary reduction and a lot less detritus. Okay, so there's going to be changes, not just in what's there on the shore, but also how the shore is going to function. Now, just to conclude, in order to adapt to climate change, we need to understand what climate change is doing. And the most important thing is to separate out the sort of long wavelength, low amplitude effects of climate change, climate signal, from the natural noise that you get in uh, marine systems, plus the sort of higher frequency effects of local um, impacts. And you can only do this with long term and broad scale data, whether it's on rocky shores or for fish stocks. Now, unfortunately, I think we're stuck with climate change for the next 50 to 100 years. And this is partly due to the physics in the Earth system. There's a lot of inertia, but it's also due to inertia and societal response. So let's just hope Glasgow gets those 2050 targets into place and signed up with some tangible action. So I think for the next 25 to 30 years, people like ourselves have got to advise politicians that we need to focus on managing the interactions of climate change with the things we, we can control. This is while hopefully new technologies are allowing us to move away from carbon-based economies. And I think we've got to be very aware of um, the global phenomenon of um, non-native species from other biogeographic realms invading areas. I think New Zealand's a bit of a leader in biosecurity. I think we've got to manage interactions of climate with regional scale impacts like overfishing of bottom fish and uh, eutrophication. And I think Iceland's clearly a leader in fisheries management. And, and it's really important to get this right because generally climate change may be worse. And if you reduce other pressures, you increase resilience to climate change um, and you also minimize the synergistic effects on things like overfishing such as failure of uh, cod recruitment in the North Sea. And similarly, you've got to manage local impacts such as pollution, particularly habitat loss, coastal habitat loss, much of it driven by inappropriate coastal development. So we've got to manage these interactions and understand them to be able to adapt to climate change. Now, I'm a generally very cheerful person. My glass is usually half full, except if you're drinking with me when it tends to empty quite quickly. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons to be cheerful. I mean, I, a few years ago, I bought my first diesel because of um, uh, incentives by the government, zero road tax, and I was able to get 60 plus uh, miles to the gallon out of my car, whereas my petrol car, I only got 30 on a good day. And that was just going from a Honda Civic petrol to a Honda Civic diesel car. And now my Honda garage is, is uh, selling electric cars. Um, so, you know, the shift's underway. When I get home, I'm going to try to get 
solar panels on my roof so I can charge up an electric car going forward when they get a bit cheaper and the batteries get a bit better. That's a bit of inertia. And also COVID, I think, has changed a lot of things. These are all the trips that I've cancelled in the last 19 months. So my carbon footprint has really been much lower. And I've also lost my gold card for various airlines. Um, I'm not commuting to the lab anymore. Uh, I haven't visited friends and family very much, uh, hardly been on holiday. And I do think that some of our day-to-day -day rhythms, such as commuting, might be um, changed by people working at home very effectively, maybe two to three days a week, rather than trekking into the office. And that might be a good thing that's come out of COVID. Sea level rise is going to affect a lot of people. I bought this house in 2000, um, when it was about a metre above extreme high, high tides. Uh, I sold it in 2020 when I moved house to an ex royal naval chap. Uh, it's now about 90 centimetres above extreme high water springs. Fortunately, this guy used to work in submarines, so he might be pre-adapted to rising sea levels. And my new house, I think, is uh, climate proof. Um, and also, very fortunately, it's very near to one of my long-term um, one of my long-term study sites. So I think there are reasons to be cheerful and I think people will adapt to climate change. And I am pretty confident that new technologies will kick in. We've had a few, a few days in the UK when we've been totally on renewable energy. And I know Iceland is well ahead of the game in terms of renewable energy. So I think we will decarbonize. It's just how quickly we will decarbonize. So just to finish, lots of take home messages. When considering impacts, you can't look at climate change in isolation. You've got to look at it in terms of regional and local scale impacts. I think, I hope I've demonstrated that rocky shores are great. There's lots of potential for work in Iceland because of the superb heritage of work done by Agna and Carl. And some of the work I've been involved in done by Jan and uh, Lilia has shown that green crabs are spreading for, for sure further north um, in Iceland. We know lots on rocky shores from experiments. We understand the mechanisms that could drive change. We can also use very cheap and quick methodology, um, semi-abundance, semi-quantitative abundance scales, quantitative work using quadrats, time searches. It's great for mapping change. And there's loads of things you can do with digital photographs to speed up sampling in the field. So shores are easily sampled. And I think this work will be very easy to translate to Iceland. I think it allows you to separate out the effects of global change from local changes due to things say like seaweed harvesting or pollution or red tides or reclamation. And certainly in the UK, it's useful to show that MPAs are working and that changes in MPAs are perhaps due to broader scale changes rather than impacts within the MPAs themselves, marine protected areas themselves. But you can only do this with long term and broad scale pattern data and experiments. Um, without the experiments, it's quite easy to make erroneous interpretations of impact. And also, it's really important to have long-term data to separate out weather from climate, because there's an awful lot of noise um, in the physical drivers in marine systems. So the final thing is, I think there's great pr pr potential after an initial professional stage to translate this into citizen science. And some of my younger colleagues uh, I've been involved in doing this work and I've already got some paper where amateurs have been trained to, uh, to look at a suite of easily identified species, backed up by the power of the smartphone for um, digital voucher specimens to make sure IDs are done properly. And uh, you can do a lot with citizen science, but I still think there's a place for professional surveys, but perhaps done annually for both getting good quantitative data and also for difficult to identify species. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. I'm sorry I probably went on too long, but I don't, uh, it's difficult to get the timing right when you haven't got a large clock in front of you in a lecture theater. And I forgot to put on my vegetable timer at the beginning of the talk. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Steve. It was perfectly timed, I think. So not to worry. More or less. Uh, Thank you so much for the talk. It was really excellent. And uh, I want to ask if uh, there are some questions in the audience. I have a couple of questions, but uh, I want to start with all the people first. Are there any questions? 
that people have. Now everyone's kind of figuring out the technology regarding this. Well, I think you have to unmute, unmute. Yeah, unmute. I don't use Zoom myself usually, so I'm a bit behind, but I don't see any hand raising buttons. Well, might be one. If anyone's got any questions, they can, they can um, send them to my email. Mm -hmm. I'll be very happy to respond. Um, S.j.hawkins at soton.ac. UK. But um, it'd be nice to have some questions. Yes. I, can I just throw in one? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious because with regard to non-indigenous species um, and the long-term data sets you have, have you had instances of non-indigenous species coming in and kind of ruining, you know, the long-term observations of the communities by taking more or less over the native fauna? Um, Yes and no. Um, a lot of the long-term sites we've got for barnacles were on exposed headlands um, where there's not so many um, Elminius modestus, uh, Ostrominius, because it's more of an estuarine species. Um, the site at Cellar Beach near Newton Ferrers, where I now live, is at the mouth of an estuary and it does have quite a strong um, invasive uh, species. Uh, it has a, a lot of uh, Ostrominius because they, they dominate further up the estuary. But at a lot of the sites, they were chosen with minimal other impacts because Alan Seifel was interested in climate change. He was interested in climate fluctuations. Um, so he wanted to rule out other impacts. So there are some examples, the Eastern English Channel, most of the Irish, inner Irish Sea, um, most of the northern Bristol Channel are completely dominated by Ostrominius modestus. And those used to be the refuges for Semibalanus balanoides. Semibalanus balanoides used to be able to occur in slightly lower salinities, um, slightly more disturbed habitats than, than cathalamids. So I've got no quantitative evidence for this yet. Um, but if I had another PhD student, I would like them to look at, and I'm not going to because I'm on my last three, so better get a move on Lilia. Um, uh, I'm on my last three or four students. Um, I think that the invasive barnacle has taken over the refuge of Semibalanus. And I think that's having sort of broad scale effects, particularly in the Eastern English Channel where there's lots of estuaries. And the other thing is Crassostria gigas or Magdalena uh, gigas. Um, and that has really taken over. And Nova's had a PhD student that I wasn't involved with, who's been doing some work on the spread of that. And that has really taken over shores, uh, particularly in Southern France, um, but also in the Eastern English Channel. And it's getting pretty common um, in some parts of Devon now, um, it's, 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 and it really does dominate and uh, change things. So there are some examples, and we've also found some invasive seaweeds. Um, there was a species that we didn't know what it was, and we make up names for things we don't know what it was, and we used to call it um, poor fire on steroids. Um, and that we actually found out eventually that it was uh, uh, Gratilupia tura tura. And we first, Nova and I first saw that in 2007 when we did some field work in France. And then a bit later I saw it in Brighton and it's now in all sorts of places in the English Channel. And that's now very important as, a, um, as an ephemeral species in rock pools. Um, and uh, similarly, in the summer, Sargassum muticum is everywhere. But it, it dies off in the summer to little stumps. And I think its ecological dominance is very short lived because of this very um, seasonal proliferation phase. And then it, in the UK and in Europe, it overwinters 
in Korea, ironically, it oversummers, it, it eastivates in the summer, where it actually kept in its native range, it has the reverse pattern. So yes, there are places where um, you get this interaction. And I think the one to worry about is Krasostria, Gygas, Magdalena, Gygas. And I was very pleased that I was consulted by one of the Icelandic agencies, um, by a really nice Polish guy who, who works up in the north, that was name I forget, um, and uh, asking about introducing uh, Krasostria to Iceland. And my, my opinion was don't go there. It was introduced into the UK by the UK government on the grounds that it was too warm for it ever to breed and it would be a it would be a um, a farm species generated by um, uh, by a laboratory culture by hatchery culture of of, um, of oysters it's bloody everywhere now it's all over France so you know just don't go there take a New Zealand view to biosecurity in Iceland don't have things in. Don't worry about stuff that's spreading naturally. I'm not worried about green crabs. You know, they're spreading naturally. They're a North Atlantic species, Northeast Atlantic species. Don't worry about things from further south because they might naturally get there anyway. But just don't have stuff from different biogeographic realms. Just don't, just don't go there. Um, so yeah, I, there are examples and I do worry about it. Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I think hopefully we're at a stage where we were not going to be introducing species for culture unless they're completely safe. But you never know when the pressure hits from the industries. Yeah, Undaria yeah. is another example. Mm -hmm. I mean, Undaria, I think the French introduced for seaweed culture and it's bloody everywhere. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> Someone else has a question? I'm seeing Kalle at the screen. I'm not sure if he's going to ask a question. He's just laughing. <laughs> I definitely have a couple of other ones. So. Okay. Uh, Steve, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you were showing the, the difference between the fauna and the flora of the shore in terms of distribution around the British Isles. You, yeah. you talked about that the, the, you don't see this separation of the northern and the southern elements in the flora as you see in the fauna. Is that because the, the, the flora is more, more distributed all around the British Isles or, or is it the definition of the what's southern and what's northern? Yeah, the, the species that we look at routinely are 60, 70 common species that you find on the shore. And that is mainly the big points, the kelps, some of the more obvious and easily to identify turf forming species. So the species that we routinely look at are probably biased towards the northern element. Um, anyway, because they're, a lot of them are large browns. A lot of the more southerly species which are occurring in, in Britain, which we don't identify, are horribly difficult to identify in the field, small reds. Um, and um, of, of, various, of various kinds. So I'm glad you asked that question because I, I hadn't thought of that before, but I think actually the, of the 60, 70 species that we choose, We've got more southern animals, and I think we've got more big northern seaweeds because we've just gone for the dominant species. If we were able in, to, in our one hour, one and a half hour surveys to do more species and identify them uh, quickly in the field, it might be slightly different. But I do think there's also an element that the, the algal fauna around the British Isles is a bit more uh, northern cold water and its affinities than the than the animals uh, to some extent but um i must alert mike to that potential artifact because i don't think we owned up to it in the paper we got published <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. 
So I think it's time for one quick question. I may have one quick question. Hello, Linus. Go ahead. Uh, so thank you for the talk. Very nice, Steve. Um, I noticed that you are conveniently, uh, your mother is conveniently placed to a, a sampling site and your home is conveniently close to a sampling site. Um, one of the things that is happening in our institute is we are asked to uh, find new ways of sampling, cheaper ways of sampling. Uh, remote sensing, drones, is that a possibility in, in this case? Um, I think it's a good possibility for looking at um, gross cover of functional groups, more, more at the ecosystem functioning level. So it would be an excellent way of measuring um, fucoid cover on shores of different exposure to get sort of gross uh, ecosystem level responses. Um, we've been much more interested in what sets within species patterns in terms of their, 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 their population abundance and also their distributions. So there you you probably do need to do a little bit more in situ work because you need to identify things. It would be impossible to identify barnacles with a drone, um, though we do barnacle species with a drone, though we do now you routinely use digital photographs rather than me counting them with a frame on the shore, which is what I did until 2005. Um, so yeah, for certain questions, I think drones are excellent. There's damn sight better than taking photographs at the top of the cliff, which I've been doing for years. And uh, I, think, I think they're really, really good for some questions. And I think citizen science is really good, provided that people are properly trained and you really filter the data, the quality of the data. Um, so there are different ways of doing things. But I'm a bit old fashioned. I like to get out on the shore and count things. I think it even says that on my Southampton website. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. I have a few more questions, but I'm going to stop myself because we don't have time this instance. But uh, I'm hoping uh, we'll, there will be a continuing of a discussion about uh, using the intertidal environment as some kind of, in a similar way in Iceland as you've been doing in the UK for such a really long the, time. The key thing is to do it for the all the former Norse kingdoms to do Orkney, Shetland, Faroes, Iceland, and also Norway, because it, they're stepping stones. And for instance, Mike Burroughs found Cathalamus stellatus in Norway. So okay. it's made the jump from Shetland to Norway. It'd be really nice to get to Faroe to see what's made it to Faroe. So if we do have a write this grant proposal that we're going to write, and I'm no longer on the committee, so I'm not conflicted, mm. um, it would be nice to start in the Orkneys and do all the all the Norse kingdoms all the way um, up to Iceland as, as stepping stones and compare with the Norwegian coast as well. Um, Nova has lots of data from Norway. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll say cheerio because it's my, my wife's online... <laughs> Pilates <laughs> class now, and she needs the bandwidth on the <laughs> system to do it. <laughs> okay. We all have our thing. All right. Thank you yeah. so much again. Take yeah. care. Cheers, everybody. Hope see you. next time it will be with a beer in Reykjavik. Okay. Sounds amazing. Ciao. Thanks.